You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. Joining us in the podcasting shed for this midweek edition of Missed Apex Podcast is BBC F1 commentator and host of the Checkered Flag Podcast, Jack Nichols. Hi, Jack. Hello. Also, Matt Trumpets is here in the cheap seats. Hey, how's it going, Spanners? Thanks for the invite. Thank you so much for coming and joining us, Jack. Firstly, congratulations on your marriage and your honeymoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, both both happened, which was which was a positive. Um, you know, you always have a bit of nerves, don't you, on the day that she's not going to turn up, but she turned up. And now, as you may, um, if you're watching on the live stream, you'll see I'm in a <laughs> sort of room with a load of clothes and perfume. Obviously, it's not my room. I just wanted to make that clear. No, nothing will ever be yours again. Are you secretly afraid that she's only... <laughs> Are you secretly afraid she's only married to you because you're a famous and fantastically wealthy international sports media sensation? That's bizarrely enough, that doesn't cross my mind because none of it is true. I hate to break this to you, but babies are also <laughs> incoming. Brace for babies, they're terrible. We got a puppy. This is the reason I'm up here is because we've got a puppy. We picked up a puppy on Saturday, so it's just yapping away downstairs with her, so I'm just staying out of that as well. Ah, puppies, the gateway babies. So, look, Jack, speaking to you is a massive thrill. As you're the voice of my Friday mornings on race weekends, I literally schedule meetings around the Five Life commentary so I can listen and read the text. And I'm sure I'm not alone. Uh, that must be a fantastic way to engage with the F1 community. Uh, yeah, the, the, the free practice sessions are, are strange, really, because I, I don't particularly believe in covering free practice which probably isn't something i should say but it's sort of nothing ever really happens and it's quite interesting afterwards to you know when you've got all the data from it to have a look and read through and you can learn some things from it but actually watching for an hour and a half i used to do it so i know that there is an audience out there for it because i used to be that audience but when you're broadcast you feel like you're never actually talking about what's happening you're just chatting around others it feels like a sort of extended edition of of a podcast almost but it feels sometimes like a waste of time (laughs) i was gonna say even though it's a commentary gig on paper it's Mm. probably closer to being like a radio dj where you're just keeping like-minded people like me company for a few hours yeah exactly and just kind of keep the conversation ticking over if something notable happens and you know someone sets a fast lap time then great go for it but in general that you, you tend to get about what five or ten minutes of of actual interest during a 90 minute session and then uh, you know of, of actual right look at this this is important hamilton's stuck on the ultra softs let's see what he can do this will tell us something the rest of the time is the teams going through their sort of procedures and stuff even the practice starts okay great they did a practice start at the end of the pit lane what did we learn nothing but we got to see him do it so it was it was cool so it's that weird so it's at least, especially on the radio, because you're not going to describe everything that we get shown on the pictures, because then you'll be saying, oh, we've just seen Pascal Verlaine go through turn four. I mean, who cares? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I am going to describe something I'm seeing on my video to our audio yeah. listeners. And that is that Jack is on an actual commentary microphone. <laughs> you, we were saying earlier, you're like the guy who turns up to a casual karting meet in his own coveralls like Van Jean. Yeah, exactly. Well... I was doing a voiceover earlier, and so th- I had all the sort of kit out, and so that's so I just picked it up, hey, and you, then, there we go. You're talking to someone who built a, a studio in his shed just so that he could play at podcasting. That's cool. That's cool. So uh, you were saying that, you know, you, you don't see the point of it, but can I ensure you, for us mugs who are stuck in an office looking at spreadsheets, <laughs> it is 100% worth it if that helps m- m- motivate you at all. Yeah, and it does, and I, and I know... And I know well, like I say, when I when it first started, which was really 2009, when the BBC had the coverage and they they got access to the practice sessions and they decided to stick it on the red button with Crofty and Ant doing the commentary, and you tuned in, it was these two, you know, mates chatting through it, and and it was awesome, and I wouldn't miss a practice session if I because uh, well, yeah, I was I was at uni at the time, so Friday mornings, I mean, you got nothing on, so um, yeah, I, I used to love it as well, so I know that people love it and i used to love it so i get it but you do sometimes sit there thinking well what am i going to talk about now because well i mean um obviously qualifying even qualifying in uh, monza being the perfect example of that of like well 
what we're going to talk about now. <laughs> I was really pleased because I was stuck at a theme park, so I was hoping it would be suspended till Saturday. But James Funnel in our chat room is saying, look, in Britain, we're used to listening to Test Match Special. So nothing oh, you can true. come up with. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could be telling us, you know, the colour of the buses coming around the corner and we'd be happy because at least it's sport. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And Test Match Special is, a, I'm not massively into into cricket, but I get that Test Match Special is, a, is an institution and I, I don't, you know, re, I don't know if there's, um, a freelancer who sometimes works for the BBC. I'm allowed to say I don't really listen to Test Match <laughs> Special, but heresy. I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm not really into cricket, but I get. I get why it's so good, and that's the sort of vibe we try and give off. We're not trying to, you know, copy them all, but just be a bit relaxed and have some well, yeah. fun. Really, it, it definitely comes on off. You've you've got some fantastic characters on there. Sometimes you have a uh, John Watson on there mm-hmm. who is just ideal for practice sessions. Yeah, yeah, he's he's fantastic. I've worked. I've been lucky enough to work with my first sort of big gig in 2011 was doing FIA GT and um, and it was with John and it was like, oh, my goodness me, this is this is just amazing. And, uh, you know, because he was a, a not a hit. He raced before my time, but um, watching all the old videos of him at Long Beach coming through the field and him blowing himself into pieces at uh, <laughs> Monza and and that sort of thing, you know. He's iconic. And then growing up with him on commentary, I mean, I never heard him on Eurosport, but he used to do British touring cars and and that sort of thing where you'd hear him. So I love working with him. And any, I mean, basically any gap that comes up in our sort of uh, schedule, I, I push very hard to, to get him on because I just, I love working with him. First time I ever worked with him was in China. I'd never worked with him, the biggest job I'd ever my life. I was, I think I was 20 at the time and, uh, or 21, but it doesn't matter. And he goes, and these Belgian team won, uh, or, or took pole, I think, Maxime Martin and uh, someone else, uh, Fred Makovic, Ma- Fred Makoviki. And the team were all hugging and kissing each other. And what he goes, ah, there's the team hugging and kissing. And he turns to me and he goes, men kissing men. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, Way to put yes, you on John, the spot. <laughs> uh, what, do, what do I say to that? He just loves throwing those curved balls in there. He's a nightmare. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I have the same trouble with uh, my resident co-host here, Matt Trumpets, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, I know, I hear spanners all the time talking about people from Scotland and the North in general. And I got to say, like, like, what's the most annoying thing that he does? I mean, because certainly he must be annoying. I, I mean, I know spanners annoys me constantly as a co-host, so. What's uh, he McNish, or? Alan McNish. McNish, Alan McNish, Alan McNish. He, um, he punches me quite a lot. Aww. Um in commentary if i take the mickey out of him a little bit i tend to get a punch in the arm so i have a dead arm for a bit um that's the main thing i annoy him more than he annoys me he hates it and it's the same with dario franchiti actually both of them (laughs) hate it when i leave my commentary booth messy so if i've left you know there's a couple of diet coke cans on the side there there's the timing sheets from free practice one that i haven't filed or whatever i'm meant to do with them i don't know then uh then they both come in and go oh your commentary booth is a mess. Sort it out. My commentary booth. <laughs> and and do they insist on driving if you have to share a car to the circuit? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't. I don't think I've ever driven with. Only one time I've driven with. McNish drives an awful lot. He drives anywhere he can. Um, Dario's not too bad. I once had to drive Dario actually in Malaysia for Formula E, and he was pretty decent. He said. I wasn't scared at all at the end, which I took was a very <laughs> as a very high compliment. I mean, it's, because, that's uh, very faint praise, though, isn't it, Jack? <laughs> that you didn't yes, frighten. But him. I think, but I think racing drivers are always very frightened to not be in a car in where they're not in control. That's what I'm taking from it. You can take what you want, but that's but that's what I'm taking from it. So, do they lord it over you? And I would imagine every argument ends with, "Well, if you were a racing driver, you'd know." Uh, they're not. Too, they're not. They're, mm, no, they're not too bad. I think they mod. They have a modicum of respect for my knowledge and i don't i don't know they have more respect than i do for my knowledge um so yeah they're not they're not too bad in that in that scenario the biggest problem mcnish does this weird thing where he will stand and just put one foot on a chair so uh, you know you know what i mean like, <laughs> well, like, like he's some up. kind of like he's some kind of cowboy like he'll stand there like that with one foot up exactly yep. commentating and you go why why are you doing that sit down or stand <laughs> up that's Is the it- annoying thing he does is that so? He's almost as high as your belt buckle. <laughs> I don't. It's it's so I noticed that he is standing up. 
I saw him at Autosport. He is actually shorter than me. But Jack, most of our favourite F1 media personalities seems to be seem to be journalists by trade or ex racing drivers. But I was hearing that your background is kind of drama. So f- for you, is is commentary just one giant improvisation session? Uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Actually, I'd never really I'd never really thought of it like that. Well, my background is my background is just commentary essentially people say oh you sound like you've been doing it your whole life very kind people who haven't heard much good commentary but they um but i i sort of have since i was six or seven i'd play with my toy cars and commentate on them since i started playing the fifa video football game um aged i don't know fifa 98 was my first one so i must so you know eight or nine you'd turn off the commentary and i'd do it myself and i'd spend hours by myself in the garden playing whole sort of football seasons and commentating on it. You know, it's very, it's not that cool. Is, that is it's excellent. Not cool. It is cool, Jack. But... And when I score a goal in five a side, I turn to the imaginary crowd and I absorb yeah, all their praise exactly. and love. So. <laughs> exactly. I... And you imagine where the TV camera is and you do a little, you know, wag of the finger or something like that. And so that's, you know, that's how I started doing it. So yeah, I did then drama and English literature at university. Um, but while I was doing that, I was just, dabbling around in commentary at the weekends like at Snetterton and Dalton Park and Brands Hatch and Donington and uh and then it all just snowed so I have no particular training in any way except just commentating for well there are many ways to on... stardom Jack so I mean if, if Hollywood came calling now and they wanted to offer you the role of the quirky less attractive friend of the romantic lead would you hand your notice into the BBC and pursue that I never did I never did any actual Ah, uh, okay. Proper acting. I, you know, I did it as a degree, but I didn't really. I basically, I liked it because it was, it was predominant. A drama degree is predominantly around. I'm not going to beat around the bush. Like there's, there's a, there's a. It's mainly faffing around and not really. I mean, I know I'm going to upset all the drama students who listen to this podcast. Uh, look, sure my, my wife's not, got a music degree and I cannot say it without doing the air quotes. Music degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like exactly, that. exactly. It's, oh, not, it's not a science. Speaking of my wife, she had a question as well because she is a singer. So she was interested as somebody has to talk so much. Do you have any vocal warm-up techniques or do you ever lose your voice? Because here before the podcast, I always invoke a bit of, you know, don't tell my heart, my achy, bricky heart. And that's it. And I just do that for like 10 minutes. Well, I mean, I don't do that. Um, you look that's, impressed, that's though. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's one of those where it's like all, you know, you should do your stretches before you play sport, but you don't. And you know, you should probably do vocal warm ups. And, and the, even as I'm talking to you now, I'm sort of hunched over the table and I have terrible, terrible posture as a general rule in life. And I know I shouldn't hunch. I shouldn't sit down. I commentate sitting down, hunched over occasionally with my feet on the table um and i shouldn't i should stand up and project from my diaphragm and and all that sort of but it's kind of bothered you're just like a natural i I think i'm quite lazy you're quite lazy oh well that's that's good you probably technically called having an efficient voice which you employ for the skills of commentary now i mean it's too late for me to change careers because i've got a house full of hungry ungrateful tiny humans who are addicted to my salary uh, with no interest in my happiness However, I have been commentary curious, and because of this podcasting, I've been invited to do a couple of things. But I'll always be a novice, but certainly the first thing that struck me is you just don't have time to be 100% right. Because if you delay trying to think about what's going to happen, another thing's happening as you deliver the words. So how do you organise all that in your mind? You just have to really like triage and say what's important. Radio is easier because... No one's watching so you can lie. So that is that is nice. <laughs> that so was sometimes be a question as well. <laughs> you know, I I so yeah, so sometimes <laughs> I do call things I mean I can't think of an example. If you call something majorly wrong, you have to you have to correct it uh on radio. This so is like last year in the American Grand Prix I muddled up Ricardo and Verstappen and I'm still really annoyed by that because Ricardo had a special blooming helmet for the for the weekend. I think it was all white, so you couldn't you couldn't miss him. But I don't know if that confused me because Anyway, whatever. So I confused that for the first half a lap and then I had to say, oh, sorry. You remember that first half a lap of commentary I did? Well, that was all wrong. I meant <laughs> Verstappen, not Ricardo, or whatever. So that's not cool. Sometimes you can say, oh, you know, oh, look at that. Eric's, you know, oh, here they come. Ericsson's run wide at turn one. And then 
you go, oh, actually, I think that was Verline. And once again, just don't bother mentioning just, it. Just take the high percentage the, chance that it's Ericsson. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, probably. exactly, exactly. And even if it is Verline, take the high percentage chance no one's going to care. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's that. And if you're not, I always find, and this is just my style, and I think there's a, I think there's an argument that I, and this isn't me being self-effacing or anything like that, I don't have... Um, gravitas is is probably the right word i'm not uh, i mean i do a lot of work with bob varsha and i do a lot of work with um and and i and you know james allen did this role before i and those are two guys with so much gravitas and authority because they say it and therefore it is so because they have the knowledge because they have and because they have the conviction in what they're saying whereas i think maybe because i don't have it i don't know my, my style tends to be a little bit more if I don't know something, I'll probably say, I don't know this, but I think the last podium was 1984 or something, whether I'm right. or So you have to cover off as long as you seem like you, if you don't know it, then you seem like you don't know it. Yeah. Then it's all right. If you, as long as you're not sort of bold and brash and go, this is a fact. Oh, right. But don't know it is. Then that, that's where you've got to try and avoid. See, I just go for fake it till you make it. Right. So I got to ask, because at every race, there's always, oh, special helmets and oh, this and oh, that. But I got to be honest, when I watch the race, no matter what anyone says, the team cars look exactly alike on the TV screen. And I know you can't see the entire circuit from from where you commentate. So, like, what's your trick? How how do you even attempt to tell these cars apart? So it it differs team by team. So, um, you know, at, at somewhere like Mercedes, it's the yellow helmet of Hamilton is pretty striking, you know, and you can tell, and often it's, it's who it isn't. Do you know what I mean? So if you see a Mercedes without a yellow helmet, you go, well, that's not Hamilton. It's Bottas. Sometimes you have to work it that way around because Bottas's helmet isn't particularly unique. The biggest problem is uh, the Force Indias, for example. I mean, they're just stupid. They paint, paint all the car pink, which is cool, fine. And then they both decide, oh, well, let's get pink helmets as well. I mean, which again, I don't know if I can say on a family show, but you know, I, w- 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 <laughs> you know, they're just they're just identical looking, you know. So there, you have to go for the the T cam, the the sort of black T bar on top of the roll hoop, and um, Ocon's is yellow, and a sort of neony yellowy flash. And so if it's neony yellowy, you know, it's Ocon. If it's not, you know, it's it's Perez. So it's that. It's not. It's not too bad. But it isn't easy at times, and with the especially Force from Indians, a helicopter shot or something yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. With the Force Indias, they actually merge their cars together quite often, so it's <laughs> even harder to tell them apart. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why it has to be so close. Why? Why can't one car just have a huge, great white stripe across it? Like, why does it have to be so close? I think it it could be easily solved. Surely uh, they did try making the numbers a bit bigger, but then you have to me- memorize who's what number, and that doesn't come easily to me. I think I just about know forty four and five. Yeah, exactly. And they make the numbers bigger, but like, so they're just not stupidly small. They're still small. They're just not outrageously small. You know, you look at, you compare it to like a NASCAR and it's just, I mean, it's just nothing like it. So I suppose it's with Formula One, you're very well versed in Formula One, Formula E as well. You probably know those drivers uh, a bit off by heart. Uh, When you were starting out, like I found at Castle Coombe, you've got a field of 30 identical cars with just the number on the side and then just a sheet of paper telling you who they are and then just trying to sort of flip between the... It can be an absolute nightmare. How do you deal with just, you know, one-off gigs, maybe? They are... It depends what the... Somewhere like that Castle Coombe is a good example. You turn up there and they've got the they've got the you know the Castle Coombe racing saloons or something like that. That only these guys only race at Castle Coombe every month or every month and a half. And there are people who go every month, every month and a half, and know all about it. And uh, and, and you're just the, the hired idiot who doesn't know one from the other. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and so you you have to arrive almost knowing that that's the deal. You have to you know you you basically know that you don't know anything about these people and you don't have time as well on a full so if i do a one-off gig what's a good example of a one-off something like the uh i do the mrf challenge sometimes in india and so you go out there and um and they've got 15 you know kids driving these basically formula Renault cars but you're there you're in the paddock you've only got 15 guys to learn so you go up and down the paddock and you can talk to them and you can write notes if you turn up on a race day and i do the motors tv uh 
live race day sometimes. Um, and that's just a desire because you have just a billion trillion people that you've never heard of and that no one else has ever heard of. And you've got to try and give it, give it some context. Well, see, we've, I've had the opposite problem as well, where there was one race where only three of the finalists turned up and they weren't close at all. I found myself oh. going nuts. I was talking about preparing for my midlife crisis and cycling Lycra by the end of it. I'd yeah. lost the plot. Uh. Uh, so, so there, that's your kind of, do you see that as a problem or an opportunity to show off and use your drama? <laughs> uh, I think, I think, I, I, I believe, I know, I know you're sort of, uh, being silly, but I think it's important to never show off in commentary ever. Like it's never ever a competition of how much do you know is my uh-huh. is my personal you know oh look at me I know the most. I think that's the opposite of what you should be doing. Um, I think you should know the most because that's the job, but only use it in appropriate circumstances in a way. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean I've had to. I mean I did a what was it? It was at Snetterton. About three or four years ago, it was the uh, it was the Mazda MX-5 12-hour race, but the series was going through a decline and something, and I think they only had six cars right. for a 12-hour race, and then oh, there were God. four um, VW Fun Cup cars as well. So that was it for a 12-hour race. And the Mazdas are reliable little cars, so they run and run, but I mean, and I was just by myself on the public address. For 12 hours? Easy. Sorry? For 12 hours? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that, so that, that... That wasn't easy, but there was also no spectators. So at some point you go, sorry. And then I wasn't allowed to talk for the last two hours because it, um, they had sort of regulations about when the, the PA could be playing. Uh, so for the last two, but I had three minutes at the top of both hours. So I had to just sit there and watch the race for an hour and then give a three minute update to nobody who was there. So I got, I, but that was cool. I, I ordered a takeaway pizza to the commentary box, which was quite oh, cool. From, oh my... from just down the road in Attleborough, I said, right, you come to race circuit, come in, turn left out, and then the tall tower down the bottom. So yeah, about half past eight at night, I got to knock on the door. There's my pizza. Almost sounds like a job there, Jack. Dangerously <laughs> like a job. <laughs> right. So uh, is there a real advantage um, to being on site for the Formula One races? I mean, I, I was already found myself wondering if you had access to additional angles or footage that we don't get to see on the world feed that, that gets played when the races are, are broadcast. No, uh, we, we all I get in the in the commentary box is the, the the broadcast that you see and also a timing screen. So, you know, the the race order and, and that's it. Um, I get a view out of the window, but. A lot of the time, it's not much. It's, you know, just the start finish. You know, if ever you know, anyone's ever been to a motor race and you stand on the start grid, you don't really get to see much that often because they just sort of flash past. In some places like Singapore, for example, you're Ooh. just on the inside of the of the final corner. And, you know, you can't complain because you're in Singapore watching Formula One. But it's literally, and, that, and that's it. And that's what well, it's not. It's, and that's it. That's all you get to, all you get to see. So, but the advantage is, in my opinion, you 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 have a very informed audience a lot of the time, especially in Formula One. I believe there's a, there's a lot of people who know a lot about it, but you so you have to bring them there. You know what I mean? It's not your job. Well, it is your job to explain what's happening in the race itself, but the key is to bring the little extra nuggets or whatever of information that that make you feel like you're there. But you don't. I mean, you look at the American coverage um you know lee diffie and and hobsey and uh steve matchett only go to i think it's two races i think they just do monaco and um uh austin of course and the rest are all done from well I, charlotte I, or somewhere like that i think given what you do jack i think you do bring that atmosphere to the guys especially all throughout the practice sessions and of course where most of our listeners will know you from is you're on a and i don't want to say this too loudly there is other f1 podcasts uh, on checkered flag podcast uh, and of course you're right there with the drivers you've got the atmosphere and at the yeah and it's key especially for that especially for that yeah. and you speak to the drivers and you're there and oh here's christian Hort. that's that's what you want from that kind of podcast maybe for the race you can just you can do it from somewhere else saying, oh, he's in front of him. But for me, the yeah, you're absolutely right. Look, just to say we could be as popular as Checkered Flag if we had driver interviews and talented, engaging presenters. But you guys seem so like hyped up as well. Like, Would you be that excited and that buzzing if you were in some studio in Manchester? I think the fact that you guys are there, you can tell that you've enjoyed the thrill of the weekend. Like, You guys never sound bored on that podcast. 
Uh, well, I'm never really bored by Formula One, despite all the things I said at the start about how boring it is <laughs> and how boring practice is. I'm never, I'm never bored by it. And I think, but you do get, and that's something I had this year, uh, last year in Barcelona, for some reason, I, I got to walk because we were a bit late on air. I was in the pit lane as the cars pulled away and left the garages and went to the grid. And it's a, it's, it's an, ex- I know it's going to sound stupid, but it felt like there was something in the air that day. And I know that sounds so stupid and I hate myself for saying that, but I got such a buzz and it was just like something's going to happen, you know, and then you have the Mercedes collide and the, and the, and Verstappen winning, you know, youngest ever Grand Prix winner and all of that. And you know, I probably do get more excited because I'm there and I'm watching it out of the window with, with my own eyes rather than watching it on the telly. You can still do a decent job watching it, you know, in a studio because I've done that before and I'll, and I'll do that again. But isn't the same. I think it's the not head, why you the, get into it. I think the headline of this is Jack Nichols admits on Mr. Apex podcast that he has psychic powers in Formula One. I, I, I really, I really do like that. Uh, Jack, we really, really appreciate your time. Just to finish up though, as a guy who's, who's there in the paddock on the track, um, we're wondering about, you know, the effect Liberty Media has had, uh, at trackside. And we've said that, you know, we've had Joe Sayward on here saying that they've made everything spectacular and they've made it a real big show. But unfortunately as well, they want to continue the path of moving towards pay TV. So they're kind of giving to F1 with one hand and, and almost taking it away with another. Well, I mean, firstly, I hope my appearance isn't as controversial as Joe's, but I... Uh, oh, that wasn't on um, this show, Jack. That wasn't... Oh, was that not No, this no, one? we have no one? objection to pictures of hats in any scenario, in a number of scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> that was that anyway. was the other guys. Oh, oh, okay. My yeah. apologies. Um, I think they have their... I think they're I think the heart is sort of in the right place. It does make a difference like the the, the paddock is it, but it's, it's these things that doesn't that don't matter to people at home. I exactly. think that's where it's got to, you know, there's a there's a really cool Heineken bar in the paddock now, which is really cool and everybody sort of hangs out there and there's way more guests allowed in the paddock. So it's got a bit of a buzz back again whereas you know, you go someplace and it was sort of felt dead, but is that catering for those 100 200 extra guests is that where you're gonna for me i really strongly really strongly believe that without free to air television formula one is in massive trouble because it is the only in in the long term because it is the and i'm not criticizing sky's coverage or anything like that because i think they're all tremendous and they're all lovely chaps and don't get me wrong they might give you a job one day so yeah 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 Exactly. Uh, well, I Smart. do the I do the Porsches for them. I do the Porsches. Oh, for them. there you go. Uh, you know, um, I get what you're saying. Yeah, uh, the long term future but, is certainly but, in peril. Because because the only way, I'd say, eighty percent of motor racing fans get into motor racing and Formula One specifically is by seeing it on the telly. You get it. You know, we've discussed football on a couple of occasions. Well, you play football at school every single lunchtime, and you see football. Yes, okay, that's on pay per view, but the highlights are on. TV and it, and it's such a and it's an all encompassing thing and you can go down your local club every week and watch football. There's football everywhere available to you. And the same with you know a lot of others. You know rugby is another good example. And I'm sure you know in the states you know all kids play grow up playing baseball and uh, American football and all of that. You don't grow up racing cars. Nope. The only way to get into car, you don't really grow up going to local circuits because what are there probably eight to 10 circuits in, in the whole of the UK. And so, uh, you know, some of which don't really have much on the only way, in my opinion, you can get people excited and into formula one is by them seeing it on the telly. And they're, they're not going to go searching for it. I think it has to be brought to them. And I think that's where it's different to other sports. So to me, it's a massively important thing to keep i don't really understand what the because we have to have highlights free to air but whether that means it will go to a terrestrial channel bbc itv or or whether that means sky will just make a you know a free to air channel that you can get on freeview or and put the highlights there i i don't know but i think it's vitally important and i think that's but liberty and are in it to, and everyone's in it to make money and not and that's not a criticism of liberty that's anyone who was running formula 1 if they were offered a billion pounds to sell the TV rights or a hundred million to not sell the TV rights, those are extreme examples, obviously, but you're going to take a billion pounds. 
I, it does feel a little bit short term and like a cash out though, uh, because yeah. if this was 1992 and I'm a 12 year old boy there and it's not free to air, I'm not into F1 now. It's as simple as yeah. that. We didn't have Sky TV money, and, and there are lots of kids out there who don't have access to these things. Of course, nowadays you can nick it, but if you're not going to nick it off the internet, uh, the extant viewers will nick it off the internet. The new ones won't bother looking for it. No, exactly. It has to exactly, and and I'm and I'm totally the same. I. Uh, it was 96 I started watching. I did go, I got taken to F1 qualifying in 97 at Silverstone, um, which was great and I loved it. But that was it. For I, I, I you know, we, I wouldn't have watched it on, well, again, we didn't have Sky or anything like that because it's expensive, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, I just don't see where the future fan is going to come from if it's not available for people to see look at boxing that's, that's i mean the, we ripped the heart out of boxing fandom didn't we we you know we grew up watching frank bruno and mike tyson and i'm, I'm not sure all the kids you know know all the modern boxers up and down through the weight classes anymore i really don't want to see that uh with with formula one uh, just lastly jack then do you feel like a as a as a commentator you have to stick yourself behind the wheel yourself ever get yourself behind a go-kart or some sim racing i do uh i love it i do love it i um I'm I'm not good enough. I have I have a moderate <laughs> I have a moderate uh, knowledge. So, for example, that we did the I did the Visa Vegas e race um, in the states in uh, January, where all the Formula E drivers raced against sim racing drivers, and um, and I did all, I didn't officially end, but I had a practice session as long as they did, and then it would have put me something like out of the thirty drivers, I'd have been like twenty fourth or something on the grid and I was quicker than Dario by three tenths of a second, which I never let him forget. Um, so like I have a moderate (laughs) consciousness of what the basic plan is that comes from sim racing. But in terms of actually, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not light enough. I, that's a big problem with (laughs) karting. I'm a good, uh, 200 pounds. Uh, you know, so that's, so that's not ideal either. So I love it, but, (laughs) <laughs> fair, not, no, fair enough. Not, I just wonder. I have visions of you uh, uh, doing uh, F1 2017 to to learn the corners before a, before a race weekend of commentary or something. Uh, but anyway, no, but it's a good it's good actually. I, do, I need to get myself a wheel though. I need to get um a, like a what's it? Not, not a play seat because that seems a bit over the top. But I need to get because I have it on my Xbox, which is by the t- TV downstairs, and you can't do it on a pad. I mean, yeah. that's just a, it's just a nightmare. Yeah, I Can you do to, it on a pad? I can't do it on a pad. I used to have a steering wheel, Jack, when I got married at first. Just saying. That disappeared mm. along with the gaming room. It all went away. Uh, Jack, the gaming room. Yeah, now I you're in to. a shed. Now I'm in a shed outside. Jack, you've been more than generous with your time. Thank you so much. It's been a real thrill to talk to you. And just to say that, uh, you know, on behalf, I think, of a lot of your listeners... Uh, for the BBC practice sessions, the way you interact with us on social media and read out comments, it really does make us feel like we're we're part of that event as well. So thank you very much for that too. No, well, thank you very much for having me on. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Uh, hashtag BBC F1 this weekend in Singapore. We'll be online for all the live coverage and, of course, the excellent Check and Flag podcast, the best Formula One podcast that is around. It's controversial. Uh, you can get. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, thanks for joining us. Jack Nichols. No Matt, that was absolutely fantastic to have a legit Formula One commentator here in the podcasting shed. Uh, yeah, it, it was. It's it's fun to get people who go to the actual races and do actual things to talk about their process and what they're thinking and where they came from. I mean, this it, uh, it's been my observation. This is really what draws people into the sport. It's not just the finished product, but it's the behind the scenes stuff that really keeps them wanting to come back. And you're never going to listen to his commentary the same way now that you know more about him. And 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 I, I think it's fantastic that all his other commentators hate the fact that he doesn't clean up his commentary booth. That's just brilliant. Absolutely. Well, well, hopefully we left him with a good impression and we can have a chat with him maybe next season or something like that. And given the off hair, he 100% definitely promised to come to the next Miss Apex karting event. I didn't hear the caveat he put in after that, but as far as I, I know, he's definitely coming. Yes. Well, it sounded like he would clearly at least consider showing up possibly. Okay, I'm going to interrupt Matt there. We will go back to him and see who he awards comment of the week, or should I say who he awarded comment of the week a day ago, because we have jumped now 
24 hours into the future in the podcasting shed so that I can talk to a bonus guest this week. It's a guy called Justin Robert Young, and he is somebody who is something of an expert in digital media and consumption of entertainment in the digital age. Also a big sports fan. He knows the lie of the land for sports broadcasting in America. And obviously now Formula One has its paymasters that are American media moguls. So we'll try and get a lay of the land in America to see what we could expect. Okay, um, don't forget to follow Jack Nichols at Jack underscore Nichols. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you know, why not tweet him and tell him how much you enjoyed him being on this Apex. Okay, on with the interview with Justin Robert Young of Night Attack. So here we are in the podcasting shed, joined by genuine podcasting legend Justin Robert Young. Welcome to Missed Apex. Uh, well, well, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, uh, I don't know if uh, if, I've, if I've ever been called a podcast legend before, but but I do I do appreciate it. Get out! Of course you have. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on, Justin. I mean, our UK motorsport audience might not be aware of your work, as we're not quite as advanced in the podcast industry as you guys are. Uh, but you're best known to me as the host of Night Attack. Uh, as part of the morning stream with uh, Scott Johnson. And and your absolute inspiration as you've made podcasting part of your professional life. So firstly, for me as an amateur hack shed podcaster, you know, what's, what's the secret to making podcasting more than a hobby? Do it for a long time. Uh, uh, I want know, a I shortcut, would... Justin. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, you know, you just go down to the store. I mean, what, what do you guys got out there? Like like Tesco's or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah, just, yeah you know, it's, it's right by the, uh, right by, by the, the, the dishwashing soap. Just uh, pick it up. A podcasting career. It's great investment. No, I mean, my secret really was uh, no secret at all. It's it's uh, uh, just keeping you know working hard on it. Uh, a lot of times now, there's probably more jobs in podcasting than there really ever were before, uh, as it has become more of a, a staple of kind of mainstream media. But for for me, I just kept doing shows that I liked and uh, kept listening to the audience, uh, which you know is, is probably the biggest thing that you learn the more you do it is for me it was always trying to oh i always tried to overcomplicate everything oh yeah and i still try to overcomplicate everything and so the audience is very very good at uh you know cutting through to like well do we need a lad like why don't we just do this that and the other you know uh and and so at a certain point uh patreon came along and that kind of filled in the money part and as soon as that happened we were off to the races and now now it's how i make my living uh, one of the best things we did was put our closest supporters into a Slack group. And like you say, as soon as you get anything wrong or step out of line, they go, stop being an idiot. We're not in for that. We're in for this. Totally. So, uh, Justin, you're not a Formula One guy per se, but having listened to you for the past several years, I would say you're definitely you know, something of an expert on the consumption of media in the new Internet age. So I kind of I want to feed off that because the world has changed and it changed very quickly. Uh, certainly so. And and really, there's probably another good five to six years of, I think, rapid, rapid change as two things happen. Number one, it gets relatively cheap for anybody who creates a niche product to package it up and sell it, specifically something with a media library. Uh, uh, that is is certainly something that is valuable to hardcore fans of something. Uh, uh, but but I would say even with sports, you know, if if. Uh, you know, you can sell for for boxing, you know, boxing's a bad example because that those rights are all over the place. But like, yeah. you know, UFC, for example, UFC could put together and they do. They have like a fight pass thing where you can watch all the old fights. Right. And, and, and they can make special different ways that you can build up for new fights by highlighting old fights that have similar styles or compilations of the two guys that are going to fight on Saturday that now have increased relevance based on your library. For Formula One, it's certainly something that for for different you know drivers or races or something like that, you can highlight the best versions of that. Well, absolutely, because uh, Formula One has been completely stuck in the past. I mean, for those of us 30-something or over, we can remember that time, Matt, when, when TV consumption was just a take-it-or-leave-it affair, and the old owners of Formula One have been stuck in that model. Fortunately, we've been taken over by Liberty Media, I think, fortunately, Matt Trumpets, and we can start doing maybe some of these things Justin's talking about. Well, I would say definitely, because right off the bat, you have these highlight packages that are coming out, like the Tuesday, Wednesday, because they call them the director's cut. And they're spectacular. It's unseen onboard footage, unseen footage that's not used in the regular coverage of the race. 
it gets tweeted out, it gets Facebooked out after the race. And I, I suspect that's kind of what you're talking about, but where someone could take years worth of that and analyze it based on team, based on driver, based on circuit. Yeah. Oh, certainly. I mean, the, the, that's that's a, a, an option. And, and effectively, it comes from this fundamental shift. And sports are an interesting thing right now because they're probably the last people to be affected by this. Yes. Because yes. live sports are still really, really relevant, if not the most relevant in the modern media age. So, for example, in America, Formula One is something that probably gets more play than you would uh, would have expected about five or six years ago as a more niche sport because you've got now six or seven different 24 hour networks that are designed uh, to, to please sports fans. And there's only so many live rights that you can have. So, uh, you know, NBC sports, which is kind of an also ran really threw in their big lot with hockey, hockey and college football. So that's both fairly popular here in America. And uh, they fill it in with formula one and soccer right? Or a football out there, right? And so they, and that's just because they're trying to snap up literally anything that they can get that's live. However, what sports also has going for them is this fundamental shift. Instead of looking outward to say, how can we be of, uh, of value to a network? They can look to their hardcore fans and say, how are we most valuable to them with zero middleman? If all we have to do is serve them bandwidth, how can we make a deal with them to make sure that we get anywhere between seven to fifteen dollars, uh, you know, per week? Right. So basically, what you're talking about would be called that's basically an over the top model where you yeah. just go around the the traditional providers, yeah, and go directly to your customers. Now, have we seen or, or any sports that really have wholesale adopted that because it, it just thinking about it, a reservation I would have about it is, well, that's going to be great. But what happens when all your hardcore fans age out and die, where are your new fans going to come from? Don't, doesn't the sport then need to also um, continue to bring new people in as viewers? 150%. But the question is exactly how worthwhile how are people finding these things in 2017? Are they finding them on Twitter? Are they finding them on Twitch? Are they finding them on Facebook, right? Uh, uh, are they finding things on a very expansive cable package right now, which, I mean, in, 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 wow. a, in America is hundreds of channels. Uh, so, you know, probably the biggest success story that we've seen with that, with this so far, and even then it's not necessarily a raging success, is probably the professional wrestling out here and and they have it i think in the uk as well that they've still sell their flagship weekly shows to a network right i think it's it's usa network out here in america i believe it's sky it will be sky uh, yeah yeah out there in in the uk but they also have uh their their entire back category uh uh on this new platform that's ten dollars uh, a month out here in America. And that is effectively for them replace what used to be their pay-per-view model. So they've got a far different business structure and we've yet to see anybody go full bore into saying, all right, we're not going to sell live rights and we're just going to go for an over the top model. But I do think that there is plenty of room uh, uh, from the NBA to the NFL to, to Premier League to to anything that can own their rights to say, let's just do original programming and back catalog. And let's just make sure that whenever you think, for example, for Formula One, whenever you are building up your hype for whatever the next race is, that you have everything you could possibly want curated uh, at, at exactly the right time with original interviews and original commentary, never before seen stuff based on the fact that we own all this. And all we got to do is slap together a documentary uh, there for you. Yeah, so that might be good for sort of our kind of generation. You do worry that it's going to turn off some of the traditional fans. 
and and stop maybe the younger kids discovering it in the first place. I think if we'd have had this model where it was only, say, on Sky TV, which I guess you would call cable TV, in 1992 when I'm 12, there's simply, we wouldn't have been able to afford it, and I wouldn't be a Formula One fan now. I mean, that's, that's a big worry. Um, but I'm a cord cutter, which I believe Matt also is, uh, so we kind of get used to picking everything uh, as and as and when we want it, as your friend Tom says, uh, what we want, where we want, when we want it. And th- the sports is the last thing that's kind of holding us by the short and curlies uh, on this. So, you know, it's it's very frustrating for people who don't have any kind of access to free to air or, or digital to, to sit and, and say, right, if I want to watch UFC, Formula One, and another sports, and they're all doing these over the top things for 10 bucks here, 10 bucks here, 10 bucks here. You're kind of almost being slow played back into buying a cable subscription again. Sure. But the issue has never really been realistically, let's make cable cheaper free. N- right. Really? Oh. Yeah. The issue has always been, let me not pay for channels I don't use. Why am I paying for uh, uh, if people who hate sports? Why am I paying for sports? People who hate lifetime why am i paying for lifetime right i never watch anything on this channel why am i paying for it uh but uh, let, let's let's back this up a little bit because again i do think that there is at least five to six years more of a lot of things turning over because not only are we going to see uh you know uh, just all these different organizations reposition themselves but you're also going to see a whole new crop of buyers for live content. And by that, I mean, Amazon, Google, Apple, these are all companies for which have a great desire to get into live video, have a great desire to have exclusive content. And I believe will be players going forward. And now the question is for them, they make it all free, right? Like if, 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 you know, Facebook buys the rights to formula one, I'll be on Facebook all the time. It's on Facebook, right? So yeah. that's how you find it. They they want to say, hey, look, if you think discoverability happens on a network, like we can target literally anybody who's ever looked at a car and and gotten excited, right? Uh, uh, that, that's something that, that they can have the data to do. So you guys are obviously a bit more used to this kind of thing. But in the UK, the fear is as with boxing, when it got sold to Sky, the, the fan base kind of just dropped out of it completely. Can Formula One survive this uh, being sold, say, to a cable company, assuming it doesn't go to Amazon or Netflix? Or do you find that in the US, once it's gone fully behind a paywall, the sports really suffer? Basically, can Formula One survive what is kind of being seen as a bit of a cash grab? Well, I think that there is kind of a difference in in uh, American and, and UK culture that like for us, cable is not looked at as necessarily the paywall that it was once, you know, so by and large, you're only getting big rights fees if you sell to cable. And in general, all these sports channels, for for example, are on a basic cable package. So you're you're, you're really not necessarily losing all that many people. But what I think now the the no brainer play is get somewhere where you are as close to free as possible and then monetize your hardcore fan base with extra content as much as you can. And for a a sport that only does it's not like you have seven races all going on at the same time no. in the way basketball or football has many, many games at the same time. So for them, their value proposition is see all the games and see the games you want. Uh, for for Formula One, it'll be more, uh, I think, just the library. Like, how worth it is that library uh, for Formula One fans, and how can they make it worth $10 a month? Let's ask one. Matt, how much would you pay for a subscription to be able to watch all the old Formula One races? I assume it would be some money. I would pay some money. Um, I would suggest, too, that uh, with Formula One, uh, in particular, what they also have is access to layers of information. Like uh, Formula One already sells a digital app and actually, entertainingly, had wandered down this path in the early 2000s when nobody was interested in it to the point where they actually gave up on the model altogether. 
Um, but they offer you not just audio commentary, but also GPS mapping of the race. And they offer you timing screens. And if you go on the computer, you can get analysis in the corners and stuff like that. So I see not just access to the catalog, but also access to layers of information. So your basic information would be just like, oh, you get the audio commentary. And then if you pay a little bit extra, you get the the GPS or a video highlights. And if yeah. you pay a little bit more, you get the timing screens, you get behind the scenes access and stuff like that. Is, is Have we seen that model in American sports at all? Um, No, not really. But then again, I don't know. Probably the closest equivalent would be NASCAR here. And I don't know exactly what they've done, uh, but I would suspect that that'd probably be the closest kind of business model uh, in terms of, of monetizing hardcore fans. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, I think that's that's certainly a huge uh, a huge value play. And really, that's, again, the big fundamental change now is as television ratings decline and less and less people watch television, mm-hmm. where does the money come from? And you always have to worry that you're going to get chased off uh, a, you know, a, a big discoverability platform. But I would also say, but listen, boxing died because boxing sucks. Boxing is is a is a corrupt. I love 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 boxing. I'm excited to watch Canelo Alvarez uh, uh, this Saturday. But the 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 organizations by which that run boxing have beaten it to the ground and hollowed out every last easy dime to the point where there is just so little that you can see. And 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 when you uh. When when you look at what the Mayweather McGregor fight was, oh gosh, it was like <laughs> it's like listen, yeah, that was that was a a a a absolute uh, uh, you know as a boxing match, it wasn't much, but guess what? It, it paid attention to the customers and it gave somebody a spectacle and they promoted it well and it was fun, which is something that boxing so rarely has been as every contender handpicks another be. <laughs> Uh, uh, opponent and then asks everybody to fork over money to watch it. You know, it's interesting you bring up boxing. Um, I grew up, uh, I, I can't quite tell how old you are from your uh, lovely profile picture, but <laughs> I grew up with Ali and Foreman on my television on Saturdays and Sundays. And when boxing went off of TV, I basically stopped following it. And yep. the point that I'm getting to is it's interesting to see it start to come back. I, I'm starting to see boxing back on tv but there was a documentary i wanted maybe a pbs documentary where someone who was a trainer said well but here's your thing if you do a pay-per-view event your fighter is getting 10 times the money yeah yeah than if they do a regular the uh, free-to-air event and it's really hard to tell somebody whose career is always going to be short because you know as a boxer you only have a limited it amount looks of time where you're going yeah. to be at the top uh, that they should take that kind of a pay cut when the money is out there. And I'm curious, I know that, that you mentioned UFC. Um, it seemed like to me that, that, that the UFC came up with a really interesting hybrid model of pay-per-view events and over-the-air stuff. And I was just curious what you thought about that. Yeah, no, they've they've done a great job, and they've they've kind of played in all three phases of that game. They they sell their live rights to Fox Sports. They do pay per view events, and they have a a app like a Fight Pass app, so you can see extra stuff and you can view their catalog. But again, there's a reason why their biggest star by far was in a boxing ring, because he could make a lot more money selling a mega boxing fight where there's not any caps and restrictions and he has uh, he doesn't have exclusivity like he does with the UFC. Now they they were still part of that deal, but he made uh, over 100 million dollars on that one fight in a sport where he has never uh professionally competed before, right? Uh he will probably make if he is aggressive and wildly successful McGregor that is maybe close to 25 million and and that's going to be a record setting payout for the UFC. So I've never begrudged boxing for a pay-per-view model. I I am a little bit younger so uh, uh every major boxing fight or match in my life uh from Tyson to Lennox Lewis and uh uh you know Delahoya they were all pay-per-view matches. Yeah. But 
you know, they just, they're stopped being good fights. They all, the, the governing body, they're sucked. And it's like, you can only make that work if I want to see that fight. And, you know, this is the first time maybe since I was 13 years old when, when, you know, Tyson had just come out of jail and Holyfield was still uh, fighting and everything uh, uh, that I've wanted to see two boxing matches in a year. Like that, that hasn't happened in, in, in many, 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 many moons. And so maybe, maybe there'll be more of a pressure to actually put together decent fights. I say bring back Frank Bruno. He didn't mind getting knocked out, then getting back up again, taking on the next get and getting knocked out again. And that's why we <laughs> loved him. Uh, but while I'm just in uh, just to kind of wrap up the sports, while I'm in the presence of two Americans, the British kind yeah. of pride ourselves on our, you know, frustratingly boring sports cricket you know formula one is often treated as a procession traditionally and it's over two hours and we don't mind if there's no overtakes in a particular race now the americans are coming in liberty media justin i know you're a huge fan of wwe that's wwf for the old guys um where it's all about the balance between entertainment and sport tilting towards entertainment uh you know could you see like liberty media daring to turn formula one into this just huge nfl super bowl type event I think that there is always going to be a a a market in any sport to highlight your stars. A sport is always at its best when you can emotionally identify with the people that are doing it. And NASCAR on its height, you know, had cult of personalities around their racers and still do. Just that the Americans are a lot better at it. And in Britain, we kind of have this attitude when a sports star gets really big for his boots, like Lewis Hamilton, who is a megastar in Formula One terms. You know, people say, yeah. oh, who does he think he is? He thinks he's bigger than the sport. But I think, you know, the Americans are much better at embracing that and saying, yeah, let's use him as an ambassador to, to build our brand. Well, I think that that equation is still the same because a star does not necessarily mean likable. No, right? star... it's certainly not. A, a star means you want to you emotionally identify with them one way or another. And whether you want to see that guy get beat or you think he's too big for his britches or you're rooting for him and you really want him to take down that that the the big bully, then then the German there's a, there's room for that. Last point. Matt. Yeah. yeah, no, uh, it brings up an interesting uh, comparison. You know, you were talking about McGregor and and boxing and how that was a huge uh, discovery event. For McGregor, yeah. both in terms of the number of people who watched it, but also clearly UFC is going to be on board with this because yeah. it's going to bring people back to UFC to see McGregor, people who are rooting for him, and they will more people will discover the sport, which will increase their bottom line tremendously. And it occurs to me that we're talking about beefing up the um, the stars of the sport. Lewis Hamilton famously hangs out with, uh, with music and fashion people. But it's also, I think, important to note that Liberty Media... One of one of their big properties or one of their big uh, sponsors is is Live Nation, which is the largest booker of live events, I think, in the world. I believe and, so. Yeah. And and I could see them. You know, you're talking about having a Super Bowl at every Formula One event. I could see them trying to bring in bigger names and more circuses just to bring more eyeballs to Formula One that will then want to keep an eye on it going forward from there. Do you think this might be part of their strategy? I mean. I don't know why you would buy something if you were not trying to make it bigger and better. If you, know, you were British, I, I think. <laughs> you know, you yeah. In in general, the old uh, the old saying, right, is to you know buy low, sell high. So if if you, you're probably buying Formula One because you believe that it is undervalued and that there is mismanagement that can be that can be done better than now. Whether or not they're right and whether or not they're the people to do it, as always, we will we will see. But if the idea is that the sport is too staid and too boring and too regal and maybe they need to highlight or take more advantage of the idea that you got these stars that are rubbing elbows with the rich and famous, then, you know, then there's a uh, listen, you can always hire a publicist. Justin, thank you so much for your time. I, I'm a passionate fan of what you do with Diamond Club and your association with Frog Pants and Tom Merritt and his tech shows. Uh, I really want to get across to my listeners here that opening themselves up to the world of Justin Robert Young means <laughs> never running out of great podcasts ever. Uh, would you mind uh, recommending uh, some of your shows? Well, I certainly do enough of them. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly doing my part to, to by volume, let people never have a free moment. But 
uh, uh, yeah, so I do a, a bunch of different stuff. Uh, uh, if you like personal stories and uh, uh, kind of a, a, a travelogue of, of my life and other people's that uh, have listened to the show uh, who email in's life, then you can uh, check out the jury show, J U R Y. If you like politics, mostly the American variety, but I hear that that's uh, you know pretty uh, you know a point of interest uh, oh, here you, in abroad. You these can't days. get enough politics, can you? Gosh. No, no, no. Uh, you can go ahead and check out politics, politics, politics. It's very easy. It's just the topic three times. Uh, professional wrestling at one nine hundred wrestling. Uh, again, daily tech news show. I'm on every Thursday in the morning stream with Scott Johnson and Brian Ibbett. Uh, I'm on every Tuesday talking about whatever the hot hell we want. Yeah, but surely the flagship for you has got to be, I mean, isn't your biggest fan base with Night Attack? And this is not the calm, measured Justin Robert Young that you have heard today speaking intelligently and eloquently. That that show's just nuts, pure bonkers. Uh, Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a it's a irreverent and ribald uh, comedy show that happens uh, Tuesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern time here in America. Uh, so it is a little bit uh, late night, early morning there for uh, for anybody out there in in in, uh, in UK time. But hey, I tell you what, the downloads are all the same. So go ahead and check it out. Night Attack. That is uh, myself and Brian Brushwood every Tuesday night. Highly recommended. Not one to sit down with your kids for. But uh, just like I said to you off air at the beginning, uh, we're not just a fan of yours. Uh, I'm a fan of the medium of podcasting and people like you and Brian and Scott have a really kind of beaten a path for podcasters to go down. So I just want to say a great, you know, huge big thank you and encourage our audience to definitely check out Justin Robert Young on the internet. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you so much. Matt, have you got a comment of the week from the chat room? Well, this is tough. Early on, it was James Fennell in the lead with uh, correcting him when he was talking about being wrong on commentary. The last podium was in Monza. Oh. And then uh, our, our friend Craig Alderson jumped in with nobody can be as bad as Jonathan Legard, wrong as Monza, but in no way likable, which I, I give extra points for, for the uh, double negative of that. But I think it's our uh, friend of the show, Thunder Beast, might have to win. No way. With the following comment. Isn't Jolian Palmer also one point away from keeping his helmet? Well, he hasn't got any points. I think that's the point. Wow, that's a really... <laughs> how come Tony now makes informed comments about Formula One? Well, there you go. Tony Thunderbeast Barnard gets... Comment of the week. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us live stream. Stop. I'm sorry. We have a controversy. Oh, no. Was, I think he was quoting Christopher Fonseca. Is that right, Tony? Tell us. Oh, Tell us. no. He's stolen his comment of the week. Now, Christopher Fonseca has to go and have a fight with Tony Thunderbeast Barn. Unfortunately, I know where, where Tony lives. I tell you what. You do the sign off. I'll sort it out in the chat room. No, no. I'll just say, Christopher Fonseca, you get. Comment of the week. And all that remains is for me to say, see you in Singapore. And remember, until then, that wounds heal, chicks dig scars, and glory lasts forever. This is Missed Apex.